Our final speaker of the evening is uh, Zainab Al Razoui, uh, who's a Moroccan born French journalist. Uh, she's a former columnist for the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. Um, she was fortunately in Morocco at the time when sadly terrorists burst in and murdered her colleagues in January 2015. Uh, she's the author of several books, including Destroy Islamic Fascism. So I'm judging, guessing by that she just really loves Islam, and I think that's what she'll be talking about now. So please give a warm round of applause to Zainab. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I I saw that uh, my my uh, speech is entitled "Destroy Destroying Islamic Fascism." So I will talk about my book, my last book, which is not translated uh, yet. I hope it will be. Um, and um, those who attended the, the panel I was participating to this uh, afternoon could maybe notice that I am a very bad translator in English, but I'll try to do my best to speak about it in my very simple English. But before that, I would like to um, say thank you to Mariam Namazi for that event and for uh, inviting me and for all the organizers also who, uh, who, who did, who made this wonderful event possible. And uh, before speaking about destroying uh, Islamic fascism, I would like just for those who don't know me to remind very briefly my experience with uh, heresy or with the blasphemy, with the kufr, with the being an ex-Muslim, with being someone uh, not very, um, <laughs> someone very Unpopular for the uh, Islamists, and also in my native country, Morocco. Um, I was uh, I was born in Morocco and um, raised just a, just like any Moroccan uh, girl. And um, in 2009, uh, I, while I was a journalist in Casablanca, I uh, decided with a group of people, uh, most of them are ex-Muslims, uh, we decided to organize a public picnic in Ramadan to protest against the um, article 222 of the penal uh, of the civil Moroccan code. This article says that if you eat or drink, I mean drink water, uh, uh, publicly during Ramadan you can be jailed from one to six months and pay um, um, something, etc. So we, we said let's organize a public picnic and just show the the, the rest of the country that there is Moroccans who don't fast and uh, who, who don't feel like criminals. Of course, we were arrested like criminals. Most of the group uh, were uh, arrested two or three days after the, the picnic and I went into hiding for 10 days and at that time, the um, uh, Moroccan Council of Olema, uh, the, you know, the theology, uh, the theologians, very important uh, men, uh, issued a statement saying that our uh, action was odious, uh, defying the, the law of God and of the prophet, and that we deserve an exemplary punishment. And they identified me at the time as the leader of that heretic uh, movement. And so that was my first fatwa. After that, uh, um, the Arab Spring came and I was one of the spoke, one of the voices of the Arab Spring because I believe that uh, there is no way for us to get rid of dictatorships if we don't get rid also of uh, um, superstition and religious dictatorships. For me, it goes together. And uh, so I, after that, I had to leave the country. I'm really trying to, um, to, uh, to, be, to be very brief. I left the country and I, uh, I started in 2011 to contribute with Charlie Hebdo, to write with them. And I joined the team as a permanent member of the team in 2013. And um, fortunately, that day I was not there. I was in Morocco and uh, so, uh, eight of my colleagues were killed among uh, 12 uh, people. 
And uh, I thought at that time that this was the worst thing that could happen. Actually, uh, Sharb, uh, who was the editor-in-chief of Charlie Hebdo, he, was, he had a contract on his head of Al-Qaeda, not very expensive contract. Huh? It was like something like $250,000. So we were joking about that in the newspaper. And, uh, um, you know, he was, Sharb, one, his, his war cry was uh, Allahu Akbar. He was always saying Allahu Akbar at the newspaper. And we were telling him, Sharb, stop, please, because the day they will come to kill you, we will not know if it's a joke. And that's exactly what happened. When the Kwashi brothers came, they just screamed Allahu Akbar twice before killing him. We thought at the time that the worst have happened, but actually uh, the persecution continued. When we published that uh, survivor's issue, what was called the survivor's issue by the media, I was one of the people who contributed to that uh, issue of Charlie Hebdo. And um, I also spoke to Arabic media in Arabic. I said the kind of things that we are saying here in that conference, but in Arabic media, in Arabic language. Of course, this is something that, uh, that is unbearable for, for, um, for those who were listening in the Arab world, of course, because of my speech and also because I'm a woman. Um, so I started receiving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of threats and insults. Okay, I was used to that, the things, very simple things like we will, we will kill you, uh, bitch, etc. That was something I was used to in Morocco. But the first, for the first time, I started receiving very serious threats, uh, uh, saying that I escaped their glorious attacks on my brothers in atheism in Paris because I was in Morocco, but they, that they will not sleep before separating the, my head from my body, etc. Um, and the second thing was a video published by a group calling itself the Anonymous Islamic Youth on YouTube. They were saying, um, it was a guy with a um, suit, a Western suit with an um, anonymous mask, an automatic voice saying that Islam is a religion of peace and love, blah, 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 but uh, uh, Islam is clear and those who insult the Prophet, I, I never insulted him actually, but those who insult the Prophet have to be killed. And so Zineb al Ghazwi, we're telling you, you will be killed soon. Uh, they, did, they didn't precise when, but it seems that it is soon. Till, till that moment, it was okay, uh, but the worst, uh, the worst threats started a few weeks later. Uh, uh, there was two hashtags uh, in Arabic in uh, Twitter. Uh, it was shared more than 7,500 times. The first hashtag was saying, um, it means the, the duty, the obligation to kill Zinab al Ghazwi to avenge the Prophet. And the second one was, uh, look, um, uh, uh, locate Zinab al Ghazwi to kill her. It was taken very seriously by the French authorities. And so, since that time, the French state hired my level of protection. And since that time, it was in 2015, since that time I live under police protection and I share my daily life with bodyguards. And I salute them, they are here with, with us in that, uh, in that uh, ballroom and I, I'm very grateful uh, uh, to, um, to them for what they do for me. Um, so uh, now let's talk about Islamic fascism. Um, I dedicated that book to Muslim atheists. Many people said it's a paradox, it's, um, it makes no, non, it's a nonsense, but actually those who are ex-Muslims perfectly understand what I mean. And I started by quoting Jean-Paul Sartre because I wanted to uh, remind uh, the left of what uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who is their icon, said, said once. He was talking about racism and he said that racism is not only a struggle against the others, it's only a struggle against uh, oneself. And Jean-Paul Sartre said that before, when he received uh, manuscript uh, books from African authors, to tell them that the book was bad, he felt obligated to like to use very kind words and to tell them, while when he receives a bad book from a white author, 
He said he could say clearly, your book is bullshit, it's a bad book. But to African authors, he couldn't say so. And Jean-Paul Sartre said, actually, I was racist when I was doing that, because there is no reason to consider that an African author deserves more, uh, you know, more um, uh, compassion uh, when he writes a bad book. And this quotation actually uh, um, is really, um, is really, um, you know, I find, I find that this idea is today what resumes what the left thinks about the Muslims. Um, my book is a very brief book with uh, five chapters. I can tell you the, the titles of the chapters now. The first chapter is uh, Islamophobia, an intellectual imposter. The second one, the chimera. How do we pronounce it in English, chimera or chimera? Chimera, yeah. In France, it's chimera. The chimera of real Islam. Islamism, a fascism like any other fascism. The French collaborationists and Islamophobia, the blasphemy, the Western blasphemy. Actually, uh, let's start by the third chapter. Why do I call Islam Islamism, actually? But I also talk about the difference between Islamism and Islam. It's something that we can discuss, but it's not the, the main issue here. Islamism is a fascism not only, uh, it's not only an expression that I use like that, when we study technically the ideology of Islamism, actually it has technically the same char characteristics as any other uh, fascism. Let's talk about some of those char characteristics. The cult of the chief and the fact that the nation is represented by one person. Who's the chief of the Islamist uh, Umma, he's still Muhammad till now. We're still now applying his laws and we're still paying the price if we criticize him, like any other dictator in the world. When you criticize him, you pay the price. You are either jailed or killed or um, tortured, etc. So this is the first char characteristic. You also have the fact that there is a flag of that ideology uh, actually, there is several flags, so now we can, we can consider that the, the main one is the ISIS flag, but you also have the Saudi flag and other flags, usually with swords, uh, uh, that are the Kalashnikovs of the time. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, in the uh, Saudi, Saudi flag you have a sword, it's the Kalashnikov of the, of the time. And you have other Islamist groups, like the Hezbollah, for instance, they have Kalashnikovs in their flag. So um, the fact of having a flag, the fact of having a ready-to-think um, ideology, having a ready-to-speak language, hatred against arts and intellectuals, um, oppressive sexism against women and homosexuals, and also the fact of using religion as an oppressive tool of the power. Certain fascisms, like the salarism, sal, uh, salarism yes, in, in uh, Portugal, used the majority religion as a tool of oppression, but the Islamic fascism actually uses religion as an end in itself. It is the aim on itself, so it's even worse. The fact of uh, having this uh, del delation system, a spying system, and actually either in the Islamic theocracies or in Islam as a religion, you have that, you know? Actually, the Prophet Muhammad invented the cheapest and most efficient police system in the world because he said, you have two angels with you permanently. The one who is in your right notes what the good things that you do, and the one who is in your left, he will tell God everything bad you do. So everyone lives with two policemen, you know, with two spies. And this is, you know, you have this, this um, uh, uh, idea of, of spying and reporting the bad and punishing the others and intervening in the life of others. It is in the heart of Islam and, of course, Islamism. You also have the fact uh, that Islam, Islamism, Islamic fascism 
like any other fascism, destroys the cultural specificities. Actually, this ideology now in Europe tries to, um, uh, to um, victimize itself and say, you have to respect me in the name of respect of cultures. But when you look at this so-called culture, you find an ideology that is trying to erase national specificities and replace it by the notion of ummah. Destroy national languages, old languages and dialects, and replace it by classical Arabic of Quran. Destroy also the costumes and make all the women wear black uh, garbage uh, uh, bags and all the men wear like white shalwar uh, kameez or kameez or jellaba. Uh, so it is uh, like a standardization of uh, the language, of the identity, of the costume, of everything. You also have uh, another uh, uh, common point between fascisms and Islamic fascism. You have the victimization. Every, every fascism is built on the idea that the group belongs to a big, a huge persecuted community, and that this community has to stand against the others and fight for its dignity and its rights. And actually, the notion of Islamophobia is the main tool helping those who struggle for that ideology to say, we are victims, we are victims in the rest of the world, we are victims, and to call uh, those who, um, who want to adhere to, the, to this ideology to act like victims and also to fight against the others because they are victims. You also have imperialism. Islamic fascism is imperialist like any other fascism. It is something that has to spread in the world, that has to uh, colonize every other country. Where, when, when they are not in Darul Islam, they are in Darul Harb. When they are not in the house of Islam, the rest of the world is considered uh, as the house of war. So it has to be concurred with the swords or Kalashnikovs. But waiting for that, they use other tools. What are these tools? Actually, they are, for instance, the tool of Islamophobia. The Islamists have been fighting in the international institutions to, to force the, the other nations to recognize blasphemy as a legal offense. When they couldn't do that, so they used Islamophobia. They, they come with a hand, hand on their heart and a tear in their eyes saying, you offended me, you are racist. When you criticize Islam or, or, or uh, when you criticize Islam, it is the same as criticizing Islamists. And actually, it is not only a sophistic uh, uh, approach. It is something very, very real and very serious. Let's say why. The word of Islamophobia entered the French dictionary for the first time a few years ago. I don't know if it's maybe six or seven years. It is explained as Islamophobia, hostility against Islam, comma, Muslims. So no difference between people and ideas. And the, word, the notion of Islamophobia have also been recognized by the Council of Europe as hostility against Islam or Muslims. Knowing that in France, for instance, racism is not considered as an opinion. Racism is a legal offense. So by admitting that definition of Islamophobia, criticizing Islam may become legally forbidden by the law. Because if criticizing Islam is being Islamophobic, then racists and racism is being forbidden, so we, f we felt in their trap. And um, this is something we have to understand and we have to fight every single day against that notion of Islamophobia and remind them that in the West, no one calls someone who criticized Christianism a Christianophobe, then a, a racist against a so-called white race or something like that. So why, why that exception for Islam? Um, let me come uh, to the chapter of the uh, French collaborationists. It is in France, but actually I think that every one of you can recognize some common 
points with your uh, different societies. Uh, the French collaborationists are, uh, yeah, uh, an important part of the left. And I just want to tell them, look at what the mullah did to the communists in Iran. Re remember this hatred that the Islamists have against communists. And I'm talking about communists because some of them see in the Islamists or in the Muslims or I don't know how to, the, notion are, the notions are very confused. They see them as a kind of new proletariat, you know? And actually, they have also to remember that the people who finance this ideology are not, not uh, have nothing to do with the proletariat. They are among the richest people in the world. They are Qatar and Saudi. You have also some feminists who became collaborationists of this ideology because they accept to discuss of Islamic feminism as something that can be of some help to women. Actually, I'm saying if we can find any, any justice, if we could find any justice for women inside Islamic, the Islamic religion, I, I think during, that during 15 centuries, uh, the several efforts that have been done would maybe find a result. There is nothing, nothing that can be used to uh, say that women are equal to men inside Islam. I think that we have to completely avoid and close that book and all the Islamic books if we want to talk about equality between men and women. Um, you also have some anti-racists. Some anti-racists who, who think that anti-racism is no more the fact of uh, speaking about universalism, same rights and same duties for everyone. They think that anti-racism is the fact to uh, encouraging what divides us, what makes us enemies. And this is definitely not the real anti-racism. You also have the so-called moderate imam. Um, I always ask myself, what is a moderate imam? Is it a guy who doesn't kill? And actually, yeah, and actually the, the so-called moderate imams in France, you find a lot of moderate imams. Every time after every terrorist attack, they run to television to say, we condemn, we condemn this uh, attack. And actually, I want to tell them, guys, thank you, but we don't need you to condemn what is already condemned by the law, what is considered as a crime. We need you to condemn your texts in your Quran, in your Sunnah, that encourage that... Yeah. Those same moderate imams during the debate on the Burkini in France, most of them were saying, yeah, for the country is get, be, be getting more and more Islamophobic and that none of them, none of them has moved his finger to say, hey guys, actually we can be Muslim and wear a swimming suit. No one did that. All of them was encouraging the Burkini and actually, uh, here you see their sexism, because we talked about the burkini many times here. Either people agree or disagree with banning it. I want to say that in, in, in Islam, you have clothing rules for women, but also for men. Those who know Islam know that men cannot wear silk, cannot wear uh, silver or gold, but we've never heard that jewelry that have been destroyed by Islamists because it's selling silver. We've never heard about uh, employees of a, uh, of a company who are demonstrating because they have, uh, I don't know, silk fibers in their uniforms. A Muslim man has also to hide all the part uh, from here, from the top of his uh, nombril, I don't know how to call that in English, to, uh, to here, to under his knees. But no one talks about a uh, caleçon, for instance. We, we see no Islamists with a kind of swimming, Islamic swimming uh, suit for men, you know, covering the knees. It means...
It means that this, this clothing is uh, something sexist, it's something of an ideology, and it is the uniform of the fascism. Every fascism has its uniform. And actually, those burka, burkini, etc., if those who wear them in Europe say that they are victims and they, are, they, they suffer from discrimination, I want to remind them that those those clothings are compulsory for hundreds of millions of women in the world. And it is used by Islamic fascism as a technique of uh, visual marking to identify those who adhere and those who don't adhere to the ideology. And so those who don't adhere become a target for terrorism, for jihad. And jihad is also a common point between Islamic fascism and other fascisms, because every fascism puts army and the military, uh, uh, um, the military system in the heart of its reign. And Islamic fascism actually has this jihad as the main, the most important thing uh, in what they, they preach, and also has the use of uh, militias. So uh, I would like to come to conclude and yeah, and just say that um, the Islamic fascism is the far right wing in the Muslim countries. And actually it has a lot of common points with the far right wing in Europe. Of course they don't want the same society they don't struggle for the same model of society, but they have exactly the same dialectic tools to struggle for their ideologies. They divide the society into communities, and they believe that those communities don't have the same rights. The far-right European wing thinks that Europe has to be white, Christian, Roman, I don't know, and that this community is uh, uh, has more rights because it is uh, older in the country. And the Islamists, they think that they have more rights because it's the will of God. And actually we have to remember and to tell this left that is being uh, complaisant with the Islamists that actually, uh, yeah, a complicity with the Islamists that actually they are putting their hands uh, in the far-right Islamic wing. And I um, also want to, um, to say again, to tell all the Muslims, either they practice, either they define their, themselves as Muslims, or either they are cultural Muslims, that we will never, never, never get rid of this, uh, uh, of dictatorships. We will never get rid of this feeling of collective failure of collective fr frustration, of failure in every, every single field, in science, in human rights, in economy, in democracy, in sport, in education. We're failing in everything. And we will never, never get rid of the, this failure until we didn't get rid of the main dictatorship that is ruling our society, which is the religious one. There is no way to get rid of the political dictatorships until we didn't understand that the main dictatorship that is ruling us is Islam and there, there will be no liberation for us until we didn't get rid of it. Thank you.